Hi, I'm Gianmaria Griglio, I'm a conductor and a composer, and welcome to the 13th episode of Conducting Pills, a series where we take a repertoire piece or a part of it and we analyze it from a conductor's point of view. In this episode, we'll dig into Ravel's Pavant pour une enfant de Funt, its magical orchestration, and of course, some technical tips. As usual, you can jump through different sections of the video by clicking in the links present in the description below. And now, let's begin! Born as a piano piece, the Pavant pour une enfant de fun was written in 1899 by a young Ravel. Ravel was born in 1875, still a student at the conservatory in Paris. Ravel himself described the piece as an evocation of a Pavant that the little princess might, in former times, have danced at the Spanish court. The princess is a figment of his imagination, and indeed the only real princess involved is the princess Edmond de Polignac, born Winnerata singer a noted patroness of the arts to whom Ravel dedicated this piece. The link to the Spanish court is clearly specified in the title with the word enfant, a title given to the children of the kings of Spain and Portugal who were not the elders. The piece falls within the lines of that renewed passion for Spanish music shared with some of the composer's contemporaries. A passion that was of course helped by the rising popularity of some very well-known Spanish composers like Albéniz and De Falla. But the link is not just a geographical one, it's also a temporal one. The Pavan was a dance that was typical of the Renaissance period and became extremely popular in the 16th and 17th centuries. The choice was not made by chance. Ravel's teacher, the great composer Gabriel Faure, had written a famous Pavan for orchestra back in 1887. Ravel orchestrated his Pavan much later, in 1910, and it is to this day one of his most popular pieces. It is a relatively simple piece, especially when compared to other works by Ravel who endured the same popularity, like the suite from Daphne St. Chloe or his piano concerto in G, for example. In fact, Ravel in later years tried to distance himself from it. He felt that it stole too much from Chabrier and complained that its construction showed quite poor form and was inconclusive and conventional. By the way, as a curiosity, Ravel himself made a piano roll recording of it in 1922 and supervised the orchestra recording in 1932. The Pavan is a very soft piece, and I don't just mean in terms of dynamics. It's soft on the Espiritus too, and this is another heritage and influence of Fauré. Wherever there are dissonances, they're never sharp, but they're always round on the angles. The structure is also very linear, it's A, B, A, C, A. The real sophistication comes with the orchestration of which Ravel was an absolute master. Take a look at the beginning. The strings, always muted, accompany a solo horn like little drops of brain on this melancholic phrase. The horn, which usually has a very warm sound, here sounds almost cold when compared to the warmth of the strings and flute answer at the end of the phrase. And the harp, so beloved by Debussy and Ravel, opens the phrase for a moment. until horns, clarinets and bassoons put a darker shade on it and lend it over to the oboe, which introduces the B section. By the way, interestingly, while all the other woodwinds and the horns are in the usual pair, Ravel here calls for only one oboe. Notice all the tempo indications that Ravel puts in the score. He starts with long, lento, slow, and then adds sede, given, au mouvement, a tempo, and enlargissant, allargando, and then back to premier mouvement, tempo primo. This alone will give you the idea of how flexible you need to be in order for the piece to come to life. You need to breathe it and let all the nuances come through naturally. The harp again underlines the atmosphere with its low note pedal.
and this second theme is repeated by the strings with the pizzicato of the double basses. Everything is very still. There are no contrasts, no tensions between sections or instruments. And we're taken back to the A section again with variations. This time the theme is played by the flutes and clarinets in octaves. Then the oboe joins in, coloring the phrase. Then the harp again. And then the genius of Ravel places the oboe an octave above the flute. Normally the flute, due to its nature, is placed above the oboe. But listen here how in this reverse position it helps creating a somewhat distant and somber moment. We then get into the C section with a very airy and dreamy flute. And then we have the warmth of the strings encouraged in their gestures by the clarinets and the oboe. And the music seems to grow for a second, creating a certain expectation to get bigger. But instead, it falls on itself and its delicacy returns like a caress. Now, in this entire section, the harp is always present in the background, painting dreams with its glissandos and arpeggios. Until in the last repeat of the A section, the harp becomes a key player in the accompaniment, on top of which the melody flows played by the violins, doubled by the flute. The dynamic here is still pianissimo. Ravel takes care of it with the orchestration. With the violins in octave, it already sounds louder and more open. And it's very easy to fall into the temptation of making unwritten crescendos or diminuendos throughout this phrase. But that would take away from the dreaminess of the line, making it overly romantic. And listen to how a single note gets colored by different instruments. First, the violins, then the harp, then the rest of the orchestra. The phrase and the piece closes on the last chord with harmonics of the strings, ending this extraordinary moment of a princess life with ethereal grace. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button right below this video and ring the bell so that you will get notified every time a new video comes out. Let me know in the comments what you think about this piece and I will see you next week with a new episode of Conducting Pills when we will talk about Ducas Sorcerer's Apprentice. Till then, bye bye.